Hello, hello. How's it going? (laughs) 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 Feeling a little rusty. What's happening, Mrs. Ryan? Welcome back. Welcome back. You know, already zoomed in here. Long weekend. Somebody did the work. I know. Uh, Well, we're off technically this week. This is a hello, everybody. Welcome back. Today is Tuesday, March 26th, 2019. My name is Jay Ryan. This is Nicole Ryan. We are the Ryans, and this is It's Tonight's Show. Uh, It's sort of the spring break week for us where we are off, but uh, we had the one show scheduled that we couldn't get around, and uh, and this is it. So we're here. Our guest tonight is uh, comedian, actress, writer, Beth Lap... Is it Lapidus, actually, is how you say it, right? Beth Lapidus, correct? I know, yeah. Yeah, uh, we started talking to her in the other room as usual, and I think it's going to be a good conversation today. So, Mrs. Ryan, yeah. there's all sorts of things to talk about from our weekend. <laughs> it was long before we uh, had this week. Anything you want to bring up? Uh, I'm in love with Jeff Sort. I'm ah! sorry. I might have to leave you for him. I get it. I get it. I'm love in love with him, guy. too. He may be on both of our list if that works. Yeah. <laughs> He's rad. We, uh, all right, well, let's start with the whole weekend. On Friday, of course, we had Breakfast Club, which was lovely. Um, mm-hmm. It was finally back to usual. Yeah. There was, I mean, the, the road is still closed because of the rock slide. Uh, maybe this week on that one, Caltrans said the weather was not cooperating last week. Uh, so that's been over a month. But with the exception of the detour and the going the long way around, it felt like an old school breakfast club to me, Mrs. Ryan. How about you? Yeah, it felt very much like it used to be just like people showed up when they showed up and everyone got there when they got there and life was just nice that day. It was such a beautiful, fun day that everyone was there for. It was. I think it was small, which probably was mm-hmm. part of it, you know, because in the old days it used to be small. And then, uh, you know, because there was less than 10 of us. Less than 10 of us there. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe about 10 of us. Um but yeah, I don't know. Just the fact that low key, no commercials, no other bullshit. It was great. Everyone got it was back to good vibes. <laughs> Finally, back to good yes. vibes. So we love you, Nuka. We love you, Danny. We love you, Freddie. We love everybody. Good to um, see everyone. Yeah, I can't wait for this week. Uh, so that was Friday, and then Saturday we were guests on Mike Senderovich's podcast, uh, the Road Stories podcast. So that was fun. I'm not sure when that'll be out, uh, but we had a great time with him going over to his studio. So good. To, to he him. was just here, and it was so good to see him again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So much, such a good conversation again. Part two. It yeah, he really asks cool. good questions. Yes. I'm going to start listening to the Road Stories podcast because um, I also, while we were there, he started telling us and showing us some of the other people he'd had on. And it was like, man, there's, there's potential for some great conversations here. So we highly yeah. recommend uh, Road Sto- the Road Stories podcast. And then on Sunday, we spent some a couple hours, spent a morning with Jeff Swart down in Orange County. And uh, oh, without saying greatest. too much about it, it was just great for us. It was just great for us. Wonderful day. Wonderful day. So it's thank you very, very day. much to Mr. Jeff Swart. Thank you. Uh, your fellow 111 folks over here are just very big fans of you as a human being. And uh, can't wait for the future, whatever that be. And Jeff Swart's going to be here soon, too, as well. So we're putting that all together. Yeah. And so that was our weekend, Mrs. Ryan. I've got some hey, videos to go through if there's nothing else you want to talk about. No. Working weekend, working busy week, just different kind of work. It's super Cranking cool. through lately. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's great. It's great. We don't know Good what's energy. happening around here, but everything is, it's definitely happening around here. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. It's really exciting. <laughs> Nervously exciting. Uh, all right. Some videos. Uh, I think they're all from Brooke and the Kaz, man. So let us just, uh, let us just check in. All right. Roll it how. Mr. and Mrs. Ryan, just the cast, man. Brooks in the back doing her job. Just want to let you know it's March, what, 22nd? It's a Friday. And oh, we're here at work. Just in case you need to know, look outside. Look outside. Look at that. Oh, it's snowing. It's just, it's snowing. Yeah. Can you get all that? End of March. We're having snow. New England. Gotta love it. It's not sticking, but it is snow. So uh, then there's that. I figured you'd enjoy a wonderful Connecticut update from, you know, this now this is what we wrote love you guys <laughs> he's so fun oh sorry Hi. mrs ryan that thing's blocking you again a little bit sorry yeah. about that um all right let's just uh, keep on going i think it might have been later that night roll it hell okay mr and mrs ryan it's a video um we just want to send a little brook and the cast man love from downtown d-block we're having mexican at el ranchero right on white street Bam, the guacamole. Yeah, guacamole. How, how's your mojito? It's good. It's great. She, she doesn't want to hold up the mojito, oh. apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Bam, mojito, okay? I have a Cuba Libre, rum and coke. She's wearing the Danbury Chives sweatshirt. 
showcase that baby. There it is. You know, the logo of the charity organization. What do we do today? Oh, we, well, we went to meditation. I'm wearing my meditation shirt. No, what else? Today. What did you do today? Oh, we booked the tickets to come see you. That's what I forgot. Sorry. We're going to be out there. Um, so mid-May, make room on the show because Brooke and the Cats, man, are going to be live in L.A. Not just an East Coast feed. We're going to be in West Coast feed. It's going to be Brooke's guest star in the Cats, man. I'll be the guest star. I'm like her sidekick. I'm kind of Robin right now, and she's kind of these folks to edit. Oh, uh, shit works. But anyway, <laughs> we love you guys. We'll see you definitely in in May. May 9th, we'll be there at night. Burbank Airport. Who's better than me for booking that shit? Love it. Bye, guys. Holy schmoly, Mrs. Ryan. She's Louise editing lessons in May. <laughs> a couple things. I would think also, or if you're going to start a feed, have the one, two, or three things that you're going to say ready. Mm-hmm. And then just, you know, we'll go down the list and then we'll just say those things. And then the other stuff can save for not on the feed. Right. <laughs> those are good producerial notes. Believe me, we're learning ourselves. All right, one more. I believe the same night. Roll it, Hal. Mr. and Mrs. Ryan, so something really funny just happened. Brooke said, I want a donut. So we're here at Dunkin' Donuts, and look, 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 she's sleeping in the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's trying to hide now, because she was sleeping in the car. I went and got her a goddamn donut, and she fell asleep, okay? This is what we're dealing with, okay? Random, love you guys. That's part two of the Mexican restaurant night where we booked the flight to LA. <laughs> I'm in. All right, so he wrapped it up with a comedy, at least. Yo, man, I'm in with donuts. <laughs> I know, Dunkin' Donuts. I, no t- I got so excited. I was I like, know. anything else, I'm fine. Uh, is that your donut of preference? No. What is your donut of preference? That's a good question. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, you answered it no already. W- well, uh, so is that is that even true? Is that true? Yes. Okay, great. Just make sure. I like love in baked goods. Um, so. Oh, so from a store like a conveyor belt. Uh, the guy with the mustache used to love the donuts. I'm sure of <laughs> it. Remember, time to make the donuts. And, and my, they were great. Then my grandma used to work there. They were fact. She used to like hand make donuts there. Oh, at night before the, all the stuff was made somewhere else and shipped in. And everything. Yeah, I gotcha. So they still bake them there, though, don't they? I, I think believe they bake so. Them they come out of yeah. But do you remember the guy in the old days with the time to make the donuts time and the to whole make thing? The donuts. Yeah, it, was it was a the great greatest. campaign. But yeah, I mean, I'm really not discriminatory about donuts, and <laughs> as long as they're a lot of my men. So. All right. Speaking of those guys, got some making a mess. Uh oh. Making a mess here. Jeez Louise. I know. What are you gonna do? Oh gosh, look at that! I made the whole show dark. Uh oh. I know. I'm ruining everything. I didn't do it. All right. So let's exciting. See. What do we got here? Hey, hey. Oh. There we go. Danbury Chai. He was just talking about. He was just talking about that logo, something new zippy. All right, that's very nice. We've got some stuff here, Mrs. Ryan. Oh, okay, doke. Got some stickers. Oh, truffle shell. Well, that's like our. Uh, we'll tell the lawyer that right now. I'm saying. Yeah, uh, and true passion, another one. Okay, so these are stickers. That's very nice. This was mine. This did not come in here. Oh, look at that. Is it a Porsche? This is a. Uh, I'm gonna need some help actually with this one. Does anyone know what this is? It's the size of a center cap, but it was installed on a boat apparently <laughs> What's it? <laughs> looks like it's a little corroded i can't tell exactly what it is <laughs> but it's a neat thing and it's clearly the porsche crest so there's that and then a magnus 277 car neat very out. nice this was sent to us from the danbury chive men the kaz men and this is very nice uh and the only thing is yep i'm sure of it now uh we got this car given to us by the guy who drives that car when he was on our show so it's on our set over there uh, but this is a fantastic duplicate that we will put into a, the giveaway pile. The giveaway pile. Yeah, love absolutely. It. So thank you guys. People That's so will nice love of you. That. And then the funny thing here, the Truffle Shuffle, for a long time, the guy who did the Truffle Shuffle in the movie was our uh, entertainment Tony. lawyer <laughs> for our company, <laughs> which is totally true. Chunk from uh, uh, the Goonies. Jeff Cohen. Is yeah. His real name. Great guy. Great guy. Hilarious. And really, I like, in the meantime, Mrs. Ryan, I should ask you the question that's on everyone's mind. Dun, 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 dun. That's right. What's going on, Mrs. Ryan? Under some glaciers, there's apparently sometimes tunnels of underground lakes. Ooh. I didn't know that. Okay. I really, I don't know what I thought was under glaciers. I hadn't put so much thought into it. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. Sure. Scientists were like. Here's the deal. The erosion of um, 
glaciers really depends on what's under it whether it's rocks or sand or water. And so they started looking more. That actually more. makes a tremendous amount of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And so the minute I read that, I was like, oh, duh. Um, so them finding lakes underneath glaciers kind of takes all the, the, those other things are fine in there in some situations, but this is a different one they hadn't really thought of before. Right, because if the water heats up, that's going to melt the, the ice faster than, say, the rock. Yeah. And it changes the ecosystems of everything. It's mm. fascinating what it changes. So I was uh, reading about that this morning. So All right, cool. Have a look into it. There's tons of new ideas to explore, I guess, was my takeaway from that. That makes sense. New theories. Yeah. Everything's dogs and cats living together. Everything's up for grabs. That's hysteria. <laughs> I know that one. It's everywhere. I love it. Um, it's poor William Atherton got screwed on that damn line. Yes, it's true. Yeah. This man has no dick. That guy can't walk down the street anymore. That's the same guy that said that. Well, Bill Murray said this man has no dick, but it was he's that the guy, guy. He's dickless. Yeah, our power grid was shut off by dickless here, and that guy can't walk down the street. He was also an asshole in Die Hard too. So it's one of those he just got typecast. He got screwed on the eighties. I did. Yeah, I did. I have heard that Great before. Actor, though. Such a yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a new luxury uh, consultant that uh, was like consulting for the day, giving his lessons to the New York Times. And it spoke to me just of like, okay, that's just, that makes sense. The new thing that people want to spend their money on is human contact and what? experience. Oh, ex- oh, sure. That's what they're finding. Absolutely. Human contact is number one, though, because people are so isolated being on their screens all the time. Oh, you don't mean physical. You don't mean like a massage human no, contact. No, no, no. You mean just I mean like, uh, interact, human interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Like on that show Maniac when the, uh, we watched where uh, the woman like fake had a fake friend that showed up one day because like they wanted a person. Mm. So, so their imagination created it? Is that what it is? I, I have to, I, I don't remember the show. Um, no, place. it's a service. So this is kind of the same thing of like integrating humans into oh, services. Right. I see. I got gotcha. you. So I gotcha. right, yeah, right. Rent a pal, basically. It, totally. Sure. And so I the, do remember what you're talking about. You needed somebody to do, to tell your stories to to unload all that stuff. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, I get super isolated, and I find myself going a little stir crazy. So. Um, the fact that this consultant was like sharing it because like tech personal tech was big in the 80s when like big com- like personal computers and like home computing mm-hmm. and stuff and so all the money went to like how do i get stuff electronic that i can have to myself mm-hmm. and now it's like i don't want that okay so it gave me a little bit of hope all right so that's hope that. is good yeah spend your money on experiences um truth saves lives And I could not agree with that more. You sent me an article about Hurley Haywood. Oh, yeah. Um, Well, he's going to be a guest on our show soon. I know. So I'm not going to go too much into it. But I had no idea about his personal plight. About Uh, the story. Yeah, I had no idea. Thanks to – but this is where we're lucky that both Hurley and Sean Cridlin, who helped tell the story, wrote the book, uh, will both be here. I I cannot wait because it's just another layer of, like, truth-telling in – Hollywood of like this is the story behind the story Mm -hmm. and like men really men are kind of women have their own thing so uh, women can do their own thing always but like men are really acknowledging the things that make them who they are and so sexuality is part of it likes are part of it like yeah even if it's not manly stuff right and so especially with these men I know I worked with someone that tried to do this with hockey one time that was like and football he was like there's people that do other things that yeah, sensitive with other people. interests it's we're not just all thugs right yeah. and so i love that hurley's ahead of this like acknowledging his story and like so there's a short that's available i think today oh good and um Maybe for bringing this up we were talking with jeff about a movie he's working on that's coming out in september that's also from the executive um, uh, producer and that's the one with the dog right that's uh, 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 uh racing in the, the art of racing in the rain art of racing in the rain and these are both from executive director or producer patrick dempsey who right. is just another sensitive guy in this really masculine world. And so the, the, it's in the lexicon of everything everyone's talking about. Have you ever worked with Patrick Dempsey? His, yes. Me too. Very What, would you, what did you work with him on? Um, that's the thing. I didn't actually, like Uh-oh. my boss, the, uh, the woman who owned my company has worked with him for a very long time. So he would go to the office once in a while. Oh, so you've had to interact so, and do stuff. Yeah. 
and, and I'm I, sure everything was teams back then too, right? So everybody's on the yeah, team. Yeah, and like kind of I was thing. at an event that he was at, and I had to walk him down a press line. So it's like, yes, I know him, but yeah, like, I only how worked did with, you? I worked with him uh, <clears throat> on the David E. Kelly show, The Practice. Oh yeah, and we only oh. did it for a couple of weeks, but he did a couple episodes. I believe we did an arc, and it was at the end of The Practice, the beginning of Boston Legal, when one when the show morphed basically. Um, right. And he was great. Uh, I was taken with how much stuff we had in common, including like his, he had Connecticut plates on his car. He had a little he race did. car. <laughs> um, and it's because it was a Panos that was, they were based out of Connecticut at the time. Anyway, very interesting stuff. Um, but he was very, very nice. And everything that you describe and then everything that everyone else describes. And uh, it's one of those, it's almost like, is he too good to be true? He's all, he's handsome. He's kind. He's, so he's nice. thoughtful. He's all those things. It's almost too good. It's fantastic. He's the nerd from that movie. He's that guy. Can't buy me love. Yeah, and like, that's what I love about him. It's what I love about so many of the nerds that are artists that are beautiful men. Oh, you're awesome. Um, right. It's beautiful. I can't wait to see what they all do. And then uh, similarly to that story, um, Keanu Reeves. Oh, I'll he's end another it one. with Keanu Reeves because I one. adore him as a human. The rest of it is awesome. Great. He's pretty. But like... <laughs> A flight from San Francisco to Burbank that was filled with a lot of uh, people that had been at a gaming conference okay. um, was deterred uh, to Bakersfield to, because there was a mechanical problem with the plane. And so they were like, oh, we have to reroute. Okay. So they landed in Bakersfield. And Keanu was like, man. Eh, was um, Keanu was on the plane. He was on the plane. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But he rented them a van. So the story, of course, is like he was on a bus with all these people. Oh, from speed. Bakersfield to L.A.? Yeah, he rented a van and like got a thing of Bakersfield facts and like read facts aloud about Bakersfield, like the population and like just had such a great what attitude. A, what a neat story. That's really cool. Yeah. That's it, really cool. We see him up at, uh, well, we see him sometimes. Yeah, he's someplace. a biker. He rides bikes up in the mountains and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's just a really super cool, I've interacted with him similarly, like tangentially but like just a super cool dude so i loved that story yeah just don't overwhelm him and like you can totally enjoy it totally <laughs> we've watched him get chased out of a couple places just because too many people too too many fan fanny things you know what i mean you can't just all be together and hang out what do you really people like people for excited, it yeah. always comes down to that you're on a bus what do you really like about him it is what it is. You're awesome. So that's it? Yeah. All that's right. So that's it. Ben. What's going on, Mrs. Ryan? Dun, 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 that's it. All right, Mrs. Ryan, let us take a quick break. Get our guest Thank you, Beth Lapidus in here. That will be very fun. Uh, more to come right after this. Beth Lapidus will be sitting right there in that chair. See you in a few. Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Ryan. Happy Saturday morning. Uh, Paul Kennel, behind the orange curtain from Kerrville, Texas for the Hill Country Rally, the last day of driving. We're actually in a small town called Comfort. It's about 7 a.m. We're at Manny's Cafe, and here's the group of cars getting ready for to this morning's drive. Uh, we did about 355 miles yesterday glorious roads uh, we're gonna do some really tight twisty technical stuff today and some farm country um, good driving uh, the only uh, mishap was we got a bad tank of Valero gas and the cars running a little crappy and if you see over there we've got our grill cover well in yesterday's morning this one went flying off and our headlight almost came off so Nothing like duct tape to save the world. Anyway, I'll uh, send you some more stuff from the road, and especially we're heading home tomorrow. Love you guys. This whole thing, yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't that funny? Well, I mean, you sit in this chair. I mean, you've sat in a lot of chairs if you've done this, and it's like, oh, my God, these chairs. Yeah, they did. They got this right. It's a very... <laughs> so am I, are we under headphones? Yeah, or no, oh, no, only no. Nicole? Just this, she likes him. She oh. likes him. But welcome I like back. Headphone. Welcome okay. back. Hello, everybody. We are here with Beth Lapidus. Am I saying your last name properly? You are. All right, according fine. to me, but not according to the rest of my family. Well, that's why I was asking. I went to high school with a Lapidus, and I think of Howard Lapidus, the producer, oh, yeah. of course. Yes, my cousin. Is it really? Not really. Oh, but, gee yeah. whiz. But we've adopted each other. All the Petuses <laughs> adopt each other as cousins. I uh, figured you might have. <laughs> There's a few of you. You have to. My family believes it's pronounced Lapides, but they're wrong. Oh. 
So, but there is another way that is that's, <laughs> that's new to me. It was lapidus or lapidus he, for me. Yes, I oh, like lapidus. Lapidus is new. Lapidus, I in, incorrect. What's the as what's, I tell them all I the time? I don't want to spend too much time <laughs> yeah. on this, but what is the nationality or where does the um, where does that come from? Well, I we it's unclear. Uh, <laughs> Russia, Perfect. Russia. I, I mean, Lapidus is a Greek, it's lapidary, and oh. it means stone. Uh, although someone told me the other night it also uh, is n- a sharp knife in another language, and Whoa. it's also gravestone in Spanish, but it's stone-like and hard. And uh, But I, I'm Jewish, and so my guess is it was Greece to Spain where there was a migration of Jews, and then there was another, during the Inquisition, Spain to Russia. So wow. I, in I have never I haven't done Whether it's the, true or not, the, the, your history is fantastic. That is that's my theory. <laughs> I like and your lineage. It's like I like it. And my name Beth means house in Hebrew. So uh, if you take the stone meaning, then my name means stone house. No kidding. Which is very safe and uh, welcoming and private or, or it means stoned in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I've moved on. Those years are behind me. I was going to say it may depend on where you are in your in life. Your, in time. your trajectory, yes. <laughs> we have so many people on that either used to smoke pot and they talk about how they used to smoke pot or how many people come on who go, they recently discovered pot and oh. all they want to talk about is like they recently discovered oh, re- pot. Oh, recently discovered mm-hmm, pot yeah. and that's their story? Mm-hmm. Wow. How old are they? Well, we are among the people that recently discovered it, but it's not part of our story. Oh, I see. Okay. But she did for you know, medicinal purposes. And stuff. Right. She used to do the daily shots and the little grenades and all the different things that you had to do for MS and that was not she was not happy about it yeah it I mean it wasn't my working body very rigid oh really oh but that's I interesting I didn't know it at the time I was really rigid before <laughs> oh okay and now are you more really seem relaxed now I'm way more I'm in so much pain but like fine okay. I'd rather be in pain and like relax, and learn how to relax I my see. body than be so stringently I tight, mean like pain is the less I mean isn't it the lessons are yeah. all pain plus time but to be mm. i mean how much of the time are you in pain would Constant. you say always yeah but like at that's a 10 a chronic, it depends on what part of my body so, so one part might be in a 10 and one part one part's does, nothing uh-huh. like, who cares so where does it hurt the most currently right here oh but like there's a bunch of stuff up in my brain too that's invisible so who knows so you're doing all sorts of like alternative therapies and right. acupuncture and all that uh, yeah, uh, n- yes and no. Yeah. Not that one, but yes, tons of alternative therapies. I spent a lot of time really thinking about what's happening and reprogramming shit up there, which sounds crazy, but like, that's no. the truth. I mean, that's, I mean, if anything, all the challenges, I mean, if you look at it, the only way to really be able to grow up and get older and mature and do the life thing is to look at the challenges as opportunities. I mean, that's, you're not going to get away from, everybody's got different stuff, you know? And I don't know, for me, once those things become things to grow through and to evolve and it doesn't fix it, um, but I don't know. I have a little thing I say that says, maybe this is perfect. Because oh, I, I always that. do want to fix it. And then as soon as I come to... I mean, really, it's like how many different ways can you find acceptance? Like, how can you think about acceptance? Because the word acceptance is so... Um, it's almost so neutral. It's like very... I find the word itself not to be that inviting. Mm, interesting. And Well, by nature, it's you either are or are not accepted. So it's y- divisive. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. But I actually think... If there's it, someone making a call whether something's accepted or not, all of a sudden there's a judgment being made and that makes it uncomfortable, right? Right. And I think actually real acceptance, I the way I've experienced it is um, it's very on and on. I mean, I can be in total acceptance of something, really total acceptance, and it disappears. And I have to give it over again and re-accept it again. And it almost mm. teaches you about impermanence. I mean, the idea oh. of acceptance is almost the impermanence lesson and the thing where we want to have it be as it is and not change. Um, I was thinking the other day and I posted that I had an, I mean, I do love the serenity prayer. I mean, if you're going to, I mean, the serenity prayer is such a go-to 
And but it would come up. I, I don't know the Serenity Prayer, but I think of Seinfeld with Serenity now. What's the oh. Serenity Prayer? Oh, the Serenity <laughs> Prayer. It's so good. Okay, uh, God, you can fill in for God whatever you want. You sure. don't have to have God, but sure. you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Okay. Cha- the courage to change the things exactly. I can, Beautiful. which are usually within yourself, mm-hmm. though sometimes they are. Th- outside of you um but generally there are not other people (laughs) (laughs) Right. Nice. (laughs) and the wisdom to know the difference that's the tricky one and that's the tricky one and um so but it can become rote like if you start using anything Uh, so much where you just like that thing that thing that thing suddenly you're like oh am i even like really feeling it so i was thinking about it the other day and i was like think about acceptance as like being open to something a new understanding Mm -hmm. sometimes i think the resistance to acceptance of a situation is that you think you understand it and so you can't accept it because you don't like the way it is but if you're open to a new understanding of it then acceptance of it can be sometimes easier sometimes opening accepting just a question like for me i've always i am such a quest for answers and knowing and Mm. you know being a smart girl you know you're like i know and you're in knowingness and uh, yeah and i think comedy also i mean comedy (laughs) really encourages you to be opinionated and know things and be bossy individual yeah unless you're super ditzy which is another way to go but if you're not like super ditzy then you're super knowing and give us an example of both (laughs) <laughs> um well gosh the because ditzy- i have some in my head i'm just curious okay if yours are let's, well what are you would be your example well, for the girl i was going to go to victoria jackson just because yeah, that's, that's a great example when you said ditzy, sure because yes. i love her she's very talented yes. but fits yes that bill. yeah and you know super knowing is like every guy you see who's just like i know this i know this you know you know that just makes the, me uncomfortable it's but they it's don't a, know shit. but it's a lot of that mm-hmm. you know and even um it's not just a guy thing because yeah i agree i mean most this is a type of person thing. a strong me. point of view is necessary in comedy mm-hmm. And so that is that what people relate to? They're relating to your point of view, right? How your understanding. I mean, what's funny is never a thing, but your take on the thing. So your take on the thing is often an opinion. And if you become too attached to opinion and you have a funny thing about that opinion, now you're in a state of unchangingness. How long and ago did you stop smoking pot? Because this is very, very <laughs> prolific and brilliant <laughs> and deep. Oh, about nine years ago. I, I don't ago. want to cut you off, but I'm, I'm, I, this is awesome. Uh, um, and so, well, I've thought about it a lot, obviously. Yeah. Um, so... There has to be a sense of understanding that is temp- that is ha- that accepts impermanence. That this is my understanding for now, and it's only my understanding, and it may shift even in the middle of doing this bit. Absolutely, and that isn't really possible in a lot of comedy situations, so that, which is why I've you know done in cabaret for so long, and um, and and so an openness to a new understanding Mm -hmm. is often the thing if i mean in my worst just oh so i was going to say questions like oh we i was wanting to know the answers and i want to know the answer and how's this going to work out how's this going to work out you know and once i open up to loving a question like not wanting to know the answer Mm -hmm. to how this is going to work out but truly loving the question of i wonder what's next and how might this work out and yeah let's talk about it let's tell possibilities show me a possibility you know and thinking it doesn't have to come from some brilliant thing inside but really start you know it's sort of getting out of the loop of your head um, but of course, physical pain is one of the most challenging. I mean, it's, I mean, you have such a sweet temperament and so you must have done a lot of work. I'm not done, but yes, it's yeah. been years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's process, right? Everything is process. And, um, I think physical pain is just literally a manifestation of everything you just said. So I think it's all the same. So I totally mm-hmm. know what you mean. Yeah. And, I don't, I've stopped judging it because like, whatever. that's a, but that's brilliant. That's I mean, that's amazing. Thing. I judge it every time, but that's what you were just saying of like, I have to keep reminding myself, like every time I send a judgment, like knock it off. It doesn't matter because it really doesn't matter. I just feel pain. It just triggers all that stuff. So right. like enough. It's a perpetual motion machine yeah. too. Because the moment <laughs> that starts, it, the whole, it, the, it's so cyclical that it yes. just. Yes. 
Yeah. You almost need somebody to come but in and really jam the gears. But I really appreciate that you can you can align it with comedy because I thought so because it you've worked through stuff. It's like word math. It's like pain math. Like you can figure it out. If you can figure out a way to tell that story in a way that it's relatable to somebody else, you could be a comedian. I I have to because otherwise, what is? I the mean, you know, point? in a funny way. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, yeah. what's that. the point? I just don't. I don't want to be miserable. Well, have you written about it? I'm starting to. Yeah. I, I've done um, numerous different ways. And like the first couple were so sad. Like, who wants to read that? Like, but what does sometimes a lot of writing is, you know, for you. I mean, I, yeah. not to say it's all process. And I do think the the ultimate writing does have the idea of an audience because you do want to. You're a communicator. You're obviously a communicator. Here you are communicating. It's in your nature to communicate. Even everything. I mean, you know, we talked about your history and PR and all. I mean, it's communication. Yeah. So if you're a communicator, I don't think journaling or writing for yourself is ever the whole picture. And I've taken issue with the morning pages. <laughs> and I'm not in. You know, I always I tell my students, don't. You know, maybe not the morning pages because <laughs> that fucking. I really was like. Maybe I not the more, so you know. <laughs> but I like the recovery of the senses, but she never gets to the recovery. I mean, yeah. it's like, there's a lot in that book, and especially art dates and really beauty and really, accept, you know, being in process with the world as an artist. Yeah. But I think, you know, leaving out the sense of humor is a big deal. And I think also all this work, you know, I, I think unless you're clearly instructed to write from gratitude, then the uh, natural instinct that people have when they do automatic writing is to complain and to sit. And that's what's on their mind, maybe? Yeah. Wow. And um, you're not looking for a solution. You've just now cemented all your complaints. Wow. Now, that's different than unspinning your mind. When your mind is spinning and, you, and you're really upset about something in that blind way where you've just like you're, you can't move forward and you have the same thoughts going around, you can't even hear what the thoughts are, then it is really helpful to sit down and write those thoughts down because you can't write as fast as you think. So it does slow. It you to slow down just by default. It slows the spinning. Yeah. And it's like, you know, one of those things, you know, you can, then you can catch your breath. Then you can also, I mean, for me. That's I'm, very interesting. I mean, that could save you from a lot of. It could save you from a lot. Time upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, and, and even though I know it, I mean, it's hard to actually make, when you are spinning, it's hard to make yourself sit down and do it. Number one, you're attached to the spinning thing. Then number two, you don't believe it's going to work because you're in now a state. You're so upset. And I am somebody who. I spent a lot of years, um, I would say my emotional literacy is lower than I <laughs> wish it were, and I can often... You're not speaking that way. Oh, you're agreed. speaking as though your emotional literacy is through the roof as well as your emotional intelligence. <laughs> well, I the know. Way you're, the way you're I speaking front. about feelings and thoughts, and you know what I mean? You, you're weaving I have, a very uh, put-together okay, well, persona here. Okay, well, I've done a lot of work you're not crazy fuck you <laughs> <laughs> i've done a lot of work i'm not saying i'm crazy but i um i've done philosophically and understanding of life and uh, but when i mean i've done a lot of that work and i've come to my own understanding of a lot i'm somebody who really does need to fi find it out for myself mm. but um when i'm in the moment of having i know this much when i'm in the moment of strong feelings i don't always know what they are are they clouded? You feel you I, sense them, but you do, can't tell which direction. I don't know. I I can be angry and not even know I'm angry. It Same. takes me a little while to Same. sort through. Yeah, yeah. I, I think especially a nice girl and and men. I am been in my head my whole. I mean, I'm very comfortable with thinking. My gosh, sure, sure, you sure. know, yeah, it's clear. Um, in but a good way. yeah, but that means <laughs> that I can lead with thinking. I'll tell you a story. Um, so uh, I'm in New York, and I I'm uh, I was a pretty successful performance artist, as you know, whatever that means. Are you from New York? Uh, I grew up in New Haven and Providence, and then moved to New York right Wilton. out of Wilton. Wilton, Connecticut. Born oh yeah, I heard yeah. you say about the Connecticut yeah, license plate. That's place. so funny. Yeah, New Haven, Connecticut's a funny place. Indeed. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we could. Yes, we could dish. We could dish, uh, and. Um, 
And I decided to set aside, you know, as NEAs and I was touring one person shows, but I was still very young. And I just thought, am I going to really, it was like, are we going to grow old together okay. kind of thing with performance art? And I just thought, I don't think so. You know, I think this is like, on the way to something. Isn't the whole thing. Um, <laughs> But and you did enjoy the process. You enjoyed what you were doing, I, the art and you I were making. And I knew I wanted to grow up and be an artist, and oh, okay. I felt very called to that. I mean, I want to grow up and be an artist was like, you know, before one of my first thoughts. Oh. I'm going to grow up and be an artist in New York. Wow. Um, and I got to New York, and then I was like, well, I don't want to do visual art because only rich people buy it, even though I was a little successful at it. I was like, hmm. And then I found performance art, and I loved performing. I had done a lot of dance in college and choreography. Loved being on stage as myself. I didn't really want to be an actress. And Are you I kind of being yourself, put, even at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and were. I put them in, in sort of together. And I was doing this visual, you know, but it was funny. And then I thought, well, it's funny for performance art. It's very funny. Oh my gosh. Okay. And performance I, art's pretty droll. Isn't, like, yeah. It's not droll, yeah. like really dry. dry. And like, yeah. I mean, and so if you, you were get getting it. some laughs as a performance, Performance artist, yeah. you know. I mean, I got a re giant review in the Boston Globe that was like, everything she says is hilarious. And it was like this, um, you know, and I was in my early 20s and that's I was like, I'm deal. hilarious. So nice, yeah. It's a big comedy town. Was, and that's but a then, lot of okay, but then I was thinking about it and I called a comedy club. This was like in the comedy boom of the 80s. And I, they were like, all right, yeah, sure. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Come to a spot. But it was a Saturday night <gasps> in the comedy boom. And I'd never performed performed in a comedy club <laughs> <laughs> I never <laughs> performed in a comedy club. So I get on stage with my little like man suit, which is, you know, for then it was a thing. And I've got my, you know, esoteric ideas. And I've been I've performing a show called The Good American Novel. I mean, it, you can only imagine. <laughs> so, you know, good and like great and Moby Dick and, you oh, know, shit. but there were personal things in it. But I mean, it wasn't stand up. I was standing up and I was funny. <laughs> and if you were in a theater, it was very funny funny and I was in the moment with it but it was a you know an hour and a half long show that all like looped in so I was knew I wasn't gonna do an hour and a half okay, okay. yeah yeah but I didn't have like an act and it's a Saturday night in Boston no. comedy town no. so is the I mean, place still there yeah I mean it was I can't remember what place it was it was oh, like okay. the Boston comedy club it was like one of the main clubs any of them in Boston yeah like on Saturday night right. you can't do right. that right <laughs> So I go and and I, the guy, the girls are all looking at their boyfriends to see if it's funny. I'm like, what is happening? Nobody but can in, figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> so is it awkward. funny? And then so anyway, I get off stage and finally, I finally, but it, well, I wasn't bombing, bombing, bombing. People were your face does not. Nothing about this story says you were bombing. By the way, well, like I wasn't you said, doing. You're telling the story like you enjoyed the hell out of it, even though it was weird as hell. It was weird, but I wasn't doing. I mean, I wasn't going over great. Uh, I mean, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. But the funny part is, well, I get you off stage. yourself as a headliner, it sounds like. No, no. I mean, it was just on a Saturday night. They weren't. Besides, I didn't even know what a headliner was. Uh, I can't even tell you how green I was to comedy clubs. And I get off stage. The rest of the lineup is standing backstage. Oh, They're all looking at me. Oh, and they say in unison, didn't you see the light? Oh. I see, and I said, I saw light. I saw a lot of lights. I saw a lot they, were, of they had the light on for you for ages. I'm sure they were blinking oh it in blue, as we do. I mean, it, what to for say? For anybody this, who doesn't know, there's a light to tell you to get off to stage. Get off stage. <laughs> oh, boom, and then you get 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it is for the club. So to say, I mean, probably I was supposed to do, you know, seven to ten, and I did maybe 15. I mean, it wasn't like I tried to do an right, hour right, right. or they something. They didn't get the hook on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it was so. Anyway, <laughs> they were waiting the for something to happen. And it was a paid gig. I mean, the guy was paying me. I remember he had a mullet, you know, and he's paying me and he was like, don't quit your day job. I was like, oh, I will. I will. And, you know, so it's, I always think of that guy and I always think, don't, you know what, you know, feel free to fail. So anyway, so that, but what I was thinking, that well, I don't know how I got into that, but the story. I'm I was, glad you told that story. That's so, so great. So I was saying, so I'm in New York and I'm transitioning from, and then I do, I decide, you know, I'm going to do it and I start getting gigs and I'm doing it in New York and I'm kind of keeping up both things, the performance art, one person shows, because I have a lot to say. And then these trying to do five minutes and 10 minutes and open mics and I start to get spots. And so I, and I'm in certain clubs, and then I audition for the Comedy Cellar one night, and I finish it, and it's all right. And um, the guy says to me, you're too grounded in your own cleverness. And I just got so mad, and I Did was... Did you know he was right? 
no <laughs> no i didn't at the time and i thought he would never say that to a guy Oh, that's what I thought. Oh, you turned I it thought, all around on him. Yeah. I thought, you know, <laughs> the, if I, and I think it's probably true. My act was, but people aren't used to hearing like just cerebral stuff from a woman. They want more emotion. They're but, just used to it. I don't think they know what they want. It's up to you to tell them what they want. But you know what yeah, I mean? They're just maybe used to it. And or maybe at the time it was also, <laughs> but then 10 years later, I was in the middle of looking at my act one night. I was like, yeah, this is awful. I don't know, with emotional truth. And you know what? I'm too grounded in my... <gasps> <gasps> How so, many years? And so it took me like 10 years. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know when what? It, when it hits, it hits, right? You know what was great? You know, you plant seeds. You know, you plant yes. seeds. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> you plant seeds for people and they don't know, you know, you don't know when that seed is going to flourish for them or for yourself. People are planting seeds in you. I mean, that's something beautiful we do for each other all the time. We just plant seeds. Yeah. And that's one reason, like, you know, people call, you know, you try to do as men, much, you know, media and interviews with people who are open to real conversation because you don't know, I don't know who's going to hear this and go, oh my God, that's right, emotional truth. You know, you just try to keep that conversation. So anyway, I, I did actually see, you know, the way the world, the universe, energy works. That's a person that I auditioned for that never, I would, ne he was a New Yorker. I never see him. I've never seen him again. I happened to see him at a New Year's Eve party like two months later or a month later. I mean, really shortly after I realized I saw him again and wow. I was able to tell him. It was really nice. That's one of yeah. those universe moments. Yeah. 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 Moment, yeah. That thing. never happened yeah. like, by coincidence. It's no, that, no. Awesome. Coincidence is yeah, just, it. you know, God being anonymous, you know, yeah, exactly. so it's all, in the patterns. it's all in the patterns. All right. Well, that was amazing. The whole first uh, half of the interview was uh, completely not even anything on the card. Oh, I well. Love it. I love it. But I want to talk <laughs> about you and then, oh, and no. who you, I mean, do you fancy yourself a, a comedian first a uh, an actor, writer. How now, do you, how, yeah. How do you? I fancy myself a hyphenate. Okay. I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't really. I mean, it's really hard for me to say what order. Okay. You know, I well, guess a writer. Like I guess the one thing that if I didn't do it, I mean, I guess a writer. It all stems from words, and yeah. mostly. I'm even when I do visual art, which I have done, and to a real. I mean, I've sold art and I've shown art and I've had art and you know exhibited in real places and. But even my artwork had words in it, you know, um, without words, nothing. Yeah, you start, you used the word communicator before. That's exactly what I would use to describe you just even before we got into the studio. Yeah. Uh, with that, I guess it doesn't matter the medium. Kind of. I mean, I do miss being, if I'm not on stage and like in a place where people can laugh, I don't know whether it's the energy. I mean, I... It's the energy. You it's, drive off the, the energy of. Your I job love the energy of helping people laugh. I love mm. that feeling of a room of laughing people. I love connecting. I mm. love. Um, I love what it brings out in me. I mean, I don't feel like I truly understand what it is I'm going to say until I say it to people. You know, I don't have it all worked out in my head and then I go stand on stage and say it, generally. I mean, I have written one-person shows and done that. But as my practice, my comedy practice is more uh, fluid than that. And it's been a lot on Cabaret. And with on Cabaret, I will write and I have a piece of paper and I've sat down and thought about it. It's not like, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I mean, I've done a lot of work on it, but generally I'm open then on that day um, to new understanding that is very present. And it you're is, ready to go on that journey on that I'm day. ready to go on that journey on the day. I always describe it like I'm a florist and I try to keep my refrigerator stocked with very beautiful flowers. And then a customer comes in and says, I need a bouquet for, for Billy. And it's uh, Billy's 25th anniversary of a work thing. Or it's Joan's 50th birthday or whatever it is. And they like this color and these, this vase. And then I go to the refrigerator and I make a very particular bouquet. For that event. For that particular thing. Or but I come occasion. with all those flowers. Mm -hmm. That's a great that's analogy. That's beautiful. That's what I try to... Like. That's how I think of it. Hmm. That's how I think of it. But And so without the performance, that kind of performance energy, then I just have flowers in the refrigerator, and I keep putting them in the refrigerator, and now they're kind of 
stuff. The fridge is stuffed and it starts to feel weird. Yes. And I can't get any new flowers, which I want. And um, oh so, gosh. I, you know, I don't feel complete also without th- that. And, um, and then, you know, in a certain way, producing isn't my first choice of a thing to do. But there is a kind like. of energy of producing that is kind of the fixery energy that is well channeled with producing. For anyone who doesn't know you out there, we should go on and say that you just celebrated a massive milestone producing your own show 25 years. <laughs> You've been it's, doing yeah. it for 25 years. I yes. mean, just this particular show. This let particular alone show, yes. Produce. Yes. Well, um, I had a producing partner who I was also married to for uh, many of those years. And he did a lot of the producing and I really kept going, you, d- yeah, I don't want to, you know. <laughs> Is that how it became? Is that when, when it was becoming something? When I, I had the idea, I started doing it and um, I had, uh, I started doing it. He then uh, had ended a relationship with a writing partner and was kind of looking around. And he and was a producer by nature, and so he started doing it. The and he was had right. produced, yeah, the timing was right, and and we had a lot of we had a good run together doing that. So, yeah. t- for anybody else, what was or what is I should say what is on Cabaret? Good Cabaret, as Taylor <laughs> Negron would say. Um, oh, I love, no, I love Taylor. 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 Um, Shout out to Taylor Negron. He's a staple of Hollywood, by the staple. way. Anybody who ever <laughs> spent any time in Hollywood knew Taylor. It was Taylor, Taylor Negron. Um, I was recently having... My, here's a very L.A. thing to say. I was recently having um, <laughs> a, a blowout, <sighs> and my hairdresser said, did somebody just pass who has dark skin and light eyes? I said, well, not just. He said, he's saying to me, you would really like me. I said, oh, my God, it's Taylor. And he said, do you have any questions? And then, so he was saying various things. I said, yeah, yeah, it's Taylor. Your stylist is a medium? And my stylist also happens to be in touch. And, wow. And, um, but it had never happened before, you know. I, he has talked to me about it, but it had That's never it. happened. And I've been with him for, you know, six years or something. And then he said, uh, I said, well, ask him if he has any advice. And, That's a good question. And David says, well, no, he says you've got to figure it out for yourself. <laughs> That's so Taylor. Oh, my God. Um, although he, the very first time I went and did Politically Incorrect, Taylor, it was my first TV thing. Was and it in New York or the one here? Here. And TV Taylor City. said to me, um, just before you go on camera, remember, you have a secret. That's right. It's your secret weapon, right? That's your secret, is that you go on there and you just know you have a secret. Wow. That's what I've just that. shared Taylor's he was big... such a lover. He was such a very magical storyteller. Okay, not to get too distracted. Sure. I'll tell you what on Cabaret. We go all over the place. We do. Right. We we ramble. Um, we're going for a Sunday drive. <laughs> 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 That's what on Cabaret really is, a Sunday drive. Um, what do you mean? Well, it's been on, su- it's been on Sunday, mm-hmm. and um, it's been... Was it always Sunday? Not always, always. I'll tell you a little. St- I'll okay. tell you the story. Okay. So I was doing the one person shows. I had done this one called Globomania that was kind of about the globe. We were just getting very global, and it was my idea was like we have this picture from space of Earth now, and we have this mm-hmm. new understanding of us from the outside since 1969. Yeah. Right? yeah, but we had got to this place like in the late 80s where that image was being used as advertising. Mm-hmm. I remember and, this. Yeah, and they it were was like for beer, and you know, and, and it was like beer this. and cars and all the things that were ruining the earth were using the image of the earth as advertising mm-hmm. and it just drove me so it was sort of like you know comedy around that and um and i was i had gotten good reviews and i was going because who on, owns the earth right who owns that the, your point? Yeah. yeah and right. that you know it was ironic and hypocritical and and we were destroying the earth with the earth it just seems so like I don't right know, let's we're, use this thing to sell more globomania we are yeah, exactly so this is a little grounded in its own cleverness, to be honest. But whatever. Ah! Ah! So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, what a ride! Uh, I love when you drive. <laughs> <laughs> so I was go. I was doing uh, like I was refreshing it before I went to Europe with it, and I there was this little art space downtown LA that was called the Women's Building, which is where Judy Chicago had done the the uh, dinner party if you've ever heard of that and if you haven't google it, it's worth looking at and um it was a major piece it was like a dinner part i'm not gonna describe it it's just it's a good thing to google <laughs> anyway um 
I went there to do it, and they were really, you know how you know how funny something is when you're a comedian? You, you, know, you kind of know the laughs you're going to get, and they were really laughing more than that. <laughs> and I said, well, when was the last mm. time you laughed? I mean, it's just not that funny. And You said this on stage? No, I said after the okay. show, because it was scripted, you know. And they were like, Ugh, we don't laugh. We're lesbians. We're women, and we're artists, and we're lesbians. <laughs> and if we go to comedy clubs, they make fun of us. And I said, you know what? When I get back from my tour, I'm going to make you a show. It's going to be unhomophobic, unxenophobic, unmisogynist. It'll be the uncabaret. And it was really a download. Like, I really don't know where it came from. It was definitely like, and they were like, yeah, oh, no, that's going to happen. I was like, yeah, that's going to happen. I mean, but. This is incredible. You know, but then to take it one step back, being open to that was a thing because I then, I came to L.A. because my partner was um, scriptwriter and he wanted to come. And I had never thought to move to L.A. I mean, I really was like, I'm going to grow up and move to New York. I had, and I was, you know. Yeah, the art thing. Yeah, I was good. For, I like was good better. there. Um, from the East Coast. Like yeah, that's and the, that's, yeah. yeah. And Both of us are dudes where you're supposed to stay. Yeah. But then I was open to it and I thought, oh, all right, it's a different thing. Sure, I'll try it. So I came out here and I was working the comedy clubs and I really was not prepared for how showcasey it was. Like New York, mm. even the comedy clubs, you know, it's, the, it's, well, now the world is different, but it was the 80s. <laughs> so, um,. So that and it I was showcasey out here even. Yeah, then. I thought it was really showcasey out here. Everybody was just trying to get their TV show. What year about are we talking about? Like Late 80s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but it was the sitcom boom, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it? it was the sitcom boom. Like everybody Jerry wanted their... Yeah. Everybody before Every, him. Sure. Everybody wanted their the development deal. Yeah. So you had your tight 10, and you did it over and over again. And, you know, and I just came from a place of being different, and I didn't really... And I remember... Um, did you feel different or you no I different? felt different yeah you felt, yeah, I felt okay. different that was from in, from me in the inside but I mean I felt different partly because people perceived I mean I felt like me but then it was perceived as different sure but I don't know that I yeah, was like other people tell you you're different yeah, and then right, so you're like right, oh I guess I'm right. different you know thanks a lot guys yeah and I mean, just to be a woman is different enough. And to then be doing this. to be doing this. And I wasn't wearing jeans and a t-shirt and wanting to be a guy. I was never like a guy. Right. I was wearing men's suits and like, you but know. But you also weren't doing the Judy Tenuta thing where you were like, hey guys. No, you know, I wasn't. Really fucking <laughs> no, I didn't face. have a big hook. And it was, you know, but comedians really supported me. I had a lot of support from the community, even guys. I mean, Rick Overton was really supportive. Oh, we love and, Rick. He's been yeah. here. Yeah. We love Rick. Um, and... I did feel encouraged. I mean, and then I did like a little art gig and there was a manager there who was Paul Reiser's manager and he was like, you're really funny. I can get you an audition at the improv and he did and I opened with my abortion joke and that didn't go well and then I didn't know to call him back. He's my manager now but that was like, you know, 20 years later. That was also magic and God, but whatever. So, Wait, so the one who said you, yes. but it took 20 years? To yes. Say, oh my God, you're that person. <laughs> I'm that person. I'm a late bloomer. You just got to sit with stuff for a while but when it cracks, it cracks big. Yeah. That's great. Um, God, and so then, awesome. so I, but I was working at the comedy store, which was not the right place for me. And, <laughs> and my why work, do you say that politically? No, because I mean the cerebral thing, you know, and yeah. the comedy store, yeah, and the energy, and and my work was getting worse. I mean, that's why. Were they because, more slapsticky then, the comedy store? I guess I don't know. I just know my work was getting worse, and the audiences okay. weren't really like my people. I don't know. It just wasn't. But New I, York sensibility is different. They yeah. play different. I mean, obviously, I don't need to tell you. But especially when you're first starting out, I would imagine. And now I don't feel like I do. Now I feel I have an L.A. sensibility. I mean, I feel oh. very ill. I mean, people still say, are you from New York? So I guess I'm not. I mean, I feel very both. I feel very both. I think you're a very understandable transplant at this point. Yeah. I, I mean, As there's. a communicator, you're an understandable transplant okay. at this point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I understand you, but you are a transplant. Okay. I get, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like a trans. I mean, that's an interesting thing with the trans. Because a trans person is never. I mean, uh, somebody who's transgendered into being a woman, if a man transgenders into being a woman, they still always have the understanding of what it was to have been a man. Mm -hmm. So it's never, even if they're perceived as a woman. Right. They so have a, both perspectives. Yeah, a transplant. I mean, and I think one of the reasons why trans is such a big idea right now is this idea of crossing over. Reinventing. Yeah, and that we need to always, you know, the us and them thing is just, 
it's just until that wall falls down and the trans idea, whether it's transplant or transgender, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's the idea that breaks that. Anyway, so I was working at the comedy store for better or worse and, and other comedy clubs and and uh, one night I had to follow Andrew Dice Clay and um, <laughs> mm. and you know he's doing his regular thing and God bless and I don't know what he's doing now maybe he's a whole new person I don't want to put this on the current Andrew Dice Clay <laughs> but the Andrew Dice Clay of then um, it, 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 if I recall it was one of the ca- there used to be characters the oh. an- whatever the guy used to have all the characters and the <clears throat> Dice Man was just a character that hit big yeah. so he leaned into it heavy <laughs> and he was leaning <laughs> very was, heavily it was very very chauvinistic I mean, yeah. the hickory dickory dock is all that comes to mind. You know? I can't even remember one thing of it. I can't even remember what I did yesterday. But, you know, but it was very <laughs> vulgar, I re- and, it, vulgar you know, and woman male. hating. Yeah, very misogynist. Yeah. And I was standing, you know, waiting to go on. And um, I was hating him. I was hating the audience for liking and laughing at him. I was hating myself for hating them. Yeah. I don't do well with hate. I don't do well with hate. I'm really not, like, comfortable in it at all. And anger, not good with. And it's not great for comedy because that's a lot of comedy comes from hate and anger. Yes, it does. So Mm. I just then I was frozen because then you're like, not only am I hating, but I don't do well with hate. And then I'm judging myself and I'm a young comedian. So I don't really have that much leeway. I mean, you know, after years on stage, you just like you have a bigger... I mean, you have re- get to rely on everything you've done, you know, and I didn't have that. And um, I, I'm sure I didn't do it. It didn't matter. It wasn't an important spot. It was just some spot in the belly room. But it mattered to me. Yeah, and that's true. in my mind was the sentence, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. But I couldn't figure out what that better way was. Um, and to go even so put a pin in that then remember that i'm a girl who when i was five was in the hospital with an autoimmune disease and uh which left me oddly opposite of what you're experiencing feeling okay not in pain but uh with a a blood thing that made me not be able to fall it was like the opposite of hemophilia i was very fragile and my blood was tested the opposite of hemophilia yeah it didn't overly clot it you know bleeding out right my neighbor had something like that yeah that's it's rough it's called itp and um you can't clot is that essentially the deal or you clot too much too much too much right and um Mm. You got too much plasma in your blood. Too much, and they didn't know why, and, you know, maybe it's aspirin, and it can be... Yeah, do you sh- remember all this? You said five years old. Yeah, I would have a lot of memories of... My earliest memories are all in the hospital. Oh, so, different. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Fragile, broken. <laughs> yep. Yep. Wah, wah, right wah, out of the wah, You know, yeah, something's gosh. wrong with you. Something's wrong with you, and oh. you feel fine. So, it's a very disconcerting thing, because... Because who's right at that point? Well, you just don't know, you know, you, you know, as an adult, though, I mean, who's right? You know, I mean, they tell you this thing's wrong with you and you go, but I don't know if it's really wrong. with You me. don't can know. I grow out of this because I decide it's not a problem. Well, I did. I mean, I, they, you can, they can take out your spleen, but they didn't. They waited. They waited. Thank God I had a very patient doctor and eventually I did. But before that, I wasn't allowed to fall and they did a spinal tap and they told me it wasn't going to hurt. And, oh, you know, all yeah. these awful things. Did it and, hurt? Uh, yeah. yeah. She had one too, and it was the worst thing I've ever experienced just being near her. It's so, I mean, so I didn't even re- know I had one until a few years ago. I said to my dad, I think I was abducted by aliens because I remember <gasps> I was on this table and there was this white light and I'm screaming oh and nobody gosh. would tell me. He said, Oh, you mean your spinal tap? I was like, Oh, oh yeah. Okay. That's the one. That's the, that. That would be it. <laughs> and What's s- the difference there, by the way, memories wise? Isn't that the same? Same. Wow. So I was like, they said it wasn't going to hurt. So I got the idea the one thing you can lie about is pain. Mm -hmm. Because that's the they always said tell the truth, but they always lied to me about pain. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt. So I grew up into this person, and there you get your emotional, you know, not being fluent emotionally. Because once you start lying about pain, you You cut down your vocabulary, right? So well, you lose touch with reality as well because yeah. you're no longer telling the truth. Yeah, really. you're not telling the truth. So what's the point of knowing any emotion because you're going to lie about it? Right. So you kind of just stop. I'm fine. 
Yeah, I'm yeah, fine. Exactly. Answer, sure. I'm fine. It's the only one anyone wants to hear anyway. Yeah. So you stop saying what's bothering you. Yeah. Or how you really feel. Because like no one cares. Exactly. Because they feel bad. They can't fix it. And yeah. Because our, our experience is if there's something wrong, then we have to fix it. Not there's something wrong and we can sit with it and mm. be just like, we don't know. You know, in not knowing. People but, don't know how to not know. We it, go in a million different directions. Like well, I'm, I'm going to bring it all together in a second. So oh, no, in the I, hospital, <laughs> it's all going to come together I in a magic full, moment. Full, full, I'm full not faith worried. in you. <laughs> so, so I'm in the hospital and the kids are playing um, doctor. And I remember looking at them thinking, we're in the hospital. And now I know, you know, okay, they're role playing and working it out. But I remember thinking, but can't we play something, anything else? Right. There's got to be a different game. We're in the hospital. Can we play, so, you know, anything? But it may as well be the operation. Yeah. You know, I, mean, bitch. I mean, it's like, is there no escape? That. Can we get out of here somehow? <laughs> so I became a voracious reader. But, um, but. To escape that environment? To escape, yeah. Uh, Good for you, though, because that's great for the creativity yeah. and imagination. Yeah, and I, you know, there's a picture of me. My first press is me sitting in the hospital bed playing with an Etch-a-Sketch and all the nurses around me. And the little, if only I were less bi and more of a lesbian, because there, the, 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 the caption under this picture is, all the girls are interested in Beth. Wouldn't that be so great? <laughs> Oh my, oh my god <laughs> so anyway coy, and i'm just coy playing with my etch a sketch and they're standing around and it's just i was a little performer even then shy but playing with my etch a sketch but hello what me it's so, so funny and um but i'm thinking there's got to be a better game there's got to be a different way so uh, then when after this andrew dice clay thing when i start thinking there's got to be a better way and that line is going through my head mm. and then i'm in a comedy club one night I can't remember what it was called. It was in the Valley. It was in Encino. Uh, it was the comedy something. And um, and I just was thinking, there's got to be a better way. And there's got to be a better way. And I was thinking, I have to do, I have to do it. Like, right. I have to. Then I got the charge of, like, this is your mission. You have to do it. It's going to be yours. Like, you could have, in the hospital, made up a different game. Mm. You could have said, gone in there and said to the kids, let's play house. You didn't have to sit in the hall and just complain. You didn't have to just think there's got to be a different game. You could have instigated it. And it was a giant a breakthrough and so at I, what age this is amazing well me. this is in my you know when i'm in la you, oh okay you, know, well, you were yeah, thinking about i, I'm, I gotcha, I'm going I'm now back to the hospital back no no with you yeah yeah the, yeah no i'm thinking moment. i could have done that sure. and i didn't but now i'm a grown-up there's a new opportunity and i have a new Did opportunity it, to mm -hmm. you know because life is like spirals and you get you don't come back to the same point you come back to the same thing like at a different vibration yes. so i'm thinking okay doesn't repeat it rhymes yeah you, and you're gonna keep getting that same thing until you work through it so i'm like oh okay okay i see it's the same thing but I'm going to have to do something about it. But what's it going to be? And then I now we're back to the women's building. And I've already now this is where I am emotionally when I get this download. Unhomophobic, unmisogynist, unxenophobic, you know, uncabaret. And now I'm the ground has been laid for that seed to come into and grow. So um, I'm like, oh, that's the way. This is the question I've been asking. Yep. Hello. And so, you know, I, I go into the road. I make a show. I don't even know what it's going to be. I just know it's going to be different. I just bring in some friends, people. You know, we experiment around, and then they lost their funding. Then I, there's a space out in Santa Monica called Highways Performance Space. Mm. And, um, and I, we did... A month of Saturday nights or maybe two months of like late shows mm -hmm. after their regular show. And it was me, uh, Judy Toll, if you remember her, sure, and Taylor Negron, both oh. RIP. And that was really, so the first, like the women's building was almost just the, almost it was the just, incubator. It, it just it was just like the uh, insemination, and then at highways was really the gestation. Oh, okay. And it's really where like the DNA was formed because all, the three of us each had different things that then kind of formed to become on cabaret. Taylor was of course very LA, very story based, very poetic, also a little hacky, mm -hmm. very cartoony. Judy was so confession. Taylor was big. I call he Taylor was big. big. Um, but also, he could tell a story like, I mean, he could tell a story it's like... the eyes, man. Yeah. You go all the way through the tunnel with and, those eyes. Uh, um, but he was very passionate about comedy. He knew people. Um, I think he was a lover of people from what I got he, from Oh, he really he was. He loved people. 
And Even if he didn't know you, it was something about you that he absolutely loved and he would find it. Yeah. I mean, we became best friends. Like, he came to see Globo. I mean, this one person show I then toured with, he... He says he says we met at the improv though I didn't remember that, and that then he came to the show to the one person show, and after that we went out to dinner. He came with us to dinner after that night, and we were just friends. I mean, it was just you know, amazing. It's and Judy was like that too. And Judy was very confessional, and everybody was her best friend. And I was a little cerebral and had this big idea, and I was running for first lady. And anyway, <laughs> I you know then I ran for first lady, and that's all, we won't get into that. But you know, and then when <laughs> Luna Park opened this great club on Robert and Jean-Pierre Boccaro um, he opened this his was his third LA club and he called me if I wanted to do something and I said well I've the, on Cabaret I've been looking for a place for it and he said um, will it be funny uh, <laughs> and I said no you know Yes. So we booked it for three Sunday nights. You asked about Sundays. Yes. This is the long way this is the That's longest okay. answer. This is great. So uh, three Sundays we booked and it ran for seven years. And the Sundays was serendipitous, but it was the right. So the three the three week commitment turned into seven years. Yes. at that same venue. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and we did it. We did a Comedy Central show during that time. I had a daily radio show during that time. What We'd, was the radio show on? It was on a network called Comedy World. No kidding. Um, was it, it satellite? It was or a internet. Pro, it was it was internet and terrestrial. Uh, it was video. It was like really ahead of its time. Okay. It was, there was, and it was Silicon Valley money with Hollywood sensibility, radio needs. I mean, it was so wow. many cultures all put that in one. It's a little neat, it was but a maybe convoluted too. I can't find. A little convoluted and a little ahead of its time. It was also video cast at the same time. If we could have figured out a way to streamline it, it's probably some version of this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but it was in a trailer park in Marina Del Rey. I learned that if you want to convince people your thing is really going to happen, show them an architect. And look, we have these architectural plans. Oh, right. <laughs> right. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean a thing. Yeah. And here's where the um, personal chef is going to be. Never even going to get it permitted. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. So we had trailer park inside of a, um, like a, it had been a special effects shop, mm -hmm. so there were like toxic eye wash stations oh, everywhere. No. No. And it, I mean, it was just As freaking on a dead end. I was like, "That's that's a little feng shui right there." Don't open a business <laughs> on a dead end. Anyway, we did it for a year, and we ran seven years. On Cabaret ran seven years. Um, we did the Say the Word spinoff shows, the other network, and uh, and then they closed the club, and we left. And All right. I, well, that's not where it ended, though, because no. twenty five years after it first started. Yeah. What you just celebrated yes. recently, and you just started a new uh, residency at the um, Rockwell. Rockwell in uh, is it so Los Feliz or Silver Lake? It's there? actually it? Los Feliz okay. on Vermont in Los Feliz, the Happies. I've been to the room because um, Jeff Goldblum performs there with his Mildred Snitzer. Orchestra. So much fun there. So charming. Yeah. So much fun. God, what a great show that is. Um, and but because of that, I know the room, yeah. and I can totally envision your show yeah. there. Yeah. Have you already? You've already done it, or yeah. you're about to? No, we've done uh, two. And how does, it, how does it work? It feels Are you great. It? Um, it just feels great. It's a great size. It's very, it's intimate, but you feel there's enough people. I mean, it's you, a very. You can put bodies in that room, but it never feels big. Yeah. It was 150. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's, that's a good high vibration where mm -hmm. you feel, I mean, it's funny, you know, it's not size. It's always if it's the right room because theater at the ace was 1600 and i thought on cabaret how's that going to work here can we really do a real on cabaret mm -hmm. you know how's that going to and i got on that stage when we first looked at that room and i thought we can do it mm -hmm. it's an you intimate can you can just it's feel it's it and you it was a, the united artists theater originally and some spaces are built for certain things that luna park room was very proto in the CBGB history. There's a book that's like the history of CBGBs. Mm, David Byrne writes this great introduction about how that room shaped. Contributed to the success. Yes. Not only of the success of the room, but the artists who played it. Yeah. And I how it shaped the music itself. Agreed. The music had to be a certain way because of the length of the room. Yep. And, and so. Like acoustically. Yeah. yeah. So you have to. I've been very fussy about the rooms I'll put on Cabaret in. And this is a great. Rockwell's a great. Um, you can tell. I great, get great that. Great feeling. Yeah. I get that. So I love yeah, that this yeah, uh, yeah. is going to. Is happening. Second Sundays. 
How, I was going to say, how do we get tickets? We've already gone over the hour. Oh, I'm ways. sorry. No, you're amazing, oh, but I want to make sure that we okay. make sure that we have people yeah, be able to yeah, get to yeah, the show. Yeah, well, we can put lower thirds, right? You know. Um, <laughs> Actually, it's pretty good. I'll I'll let you tell them right now, and I'll take a, a, a an Instagram story of you. Tell All right. Uh, okay. How do I find it? How do I find it? Uh, you can get tickets for Uncabaret at Rockwell at uncabaret.com that's u-n-c-a-b-a-r-e-t there's a link to it on our instagram story um on our instagram page or everywhere and you can also go to rockwell.com if you prefer to skip uncabaret.com but get on our uh, email list because uh, you get lineups and you know i actually do write if you like the first half of this <laughs> interview really that part. <laughs> you can tell everybody else here. oh geez now i can't shut you up now oh Holy no cow. sorry sorry I want to hear the rest from you, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, I do. I you know I kind of write that stuff in the email. And what about uh, social media? People follow you on social, yeah, right? Sure, of course. Uh, so follow me on social. Well, I mean, is, is there specific? Name? Oh, uh, at on Cabaret on Twitter and oh, is Instagram. That your personal? Your no, and then I have Beth uh, Beth Lapidus on Twitter and Beth uh, underscore Lapidus on Instagram. Looking for any more Instagram. followers in these places? Of course, I invite you to follow me. There Please do follow me desperately. I'm desperate <laughs> for you to follow me. I've been waiting for you to follow me, Beth Lapidus. L a p i d e s. The only reason she it did yells with to yes. More followers. It, I know it. it rhymes with yes. Hey, I bet that was fun in high school. <laughs> <laughs> it was different. Lapinus was the high school oh, version. That Lapinus, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, do you have anything else for us, just to wrap it up very quickly? Um, I, I would love to have. I would love to converse with you more because I feel like there was a connection to be made here, or made here, but we didn't get to really dive too deep. We didn't? Well, we got to hear all about on Cabaret, but I, I want to hear more about you. Oh, me? Okay. In the future. In the future. Yeah, I'll come I'm back. come back sometime. I'll come back. Oh. I, I think the first half was a lot about me, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, maybe. I think. I don't know. Maybe I just need a chance to look at my What did you want to know? I didn't get to. Oh, no well, well, what are we going to cover next time? Oh, there's no time. People, there's always a part two. I'm sorry. Did I hijack your interview? No. Oh. I told you. It was just a conversation. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. If it becomes an interview, it's not it's enjoyable not us. to either, no. either one. It's really anybody. Conversation is really everything. That is really my religion. Don't you think? Same. Yeah, no. Yeah, I yeah, do. Communicator. Communicator. I love that. All right, Mrs. Ryan, who do we have tomorrow? What's going on here? Tomorrow. Nothing. Oh, my gosh, this is it. We're off. We're off this week. I forgot. Um, in that case, Friday. Friday, we've still got Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see everybody then. Mrs. Ryan, I love you so much. Love you, too. Beth Lapidus. Thank we you, love the Ryans. You so oh, well, I think Beth Lapidus. Good to see you again. We love everybody at home. Please love one another, and we will see you next week.